So there's no queue. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening in Beijing. Uh, thank you all for coming, and especially to the panelists and the moderator for getting online so bright and early to share their work with us. Welcome to what is the first event in the Brokex seminar series this fall at the University of Oslo. My name is Heidi Spahogin, and Brokex is the short name for the project Brokering China's Extraversion and Ethnographic Analysis of Transnational Arbitration. I must thank the European Research Council for funding Brokex and in general for not being afraid to put money into interdisciplinary and empirically rich research. And the team, in addition to myself, includes uh, Siv Helen Oftedal, which has organized this panel along with another postdoc and two PhD scholars. The seminar series is about how Chinese and global actors uh, interact, and it's also about the role of brokerage in development processes. Today, we'll hear the argument that the Chinese Communist Party's gradualist approach to reform was not inevitable, and we'll look at some of the paths that were not taken and why they were abandoned, as well as discuss how the current approach can serve China in the future. And the, few, the scholars who will shed light on this are, as you know, Scott Rossell and Isabella Weber, who both will speak based on their recently published books. We have read them, go and read them. Uh, and our colleague, Dr. Wendy Leuter, will introduce these panelists and share the session. So welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us for today's seminar uh, organized by the University of Oslo on China's economy challenges created by the reform era. Uh, my name is Wendy Leuter, and I am an assistant professor at Indiana University, uh, where my research and teaching focus on the politics and economy of China and state-owned enterprises in particular. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to welcome two distinguished scholars, uh, Dr. Isabella Weber and Dr. Scott Rosell, uh, who will be speaking to us about their new books. Uh, speaking first today about economic developments and debates in China during the 1980s is Dr. Isabella Weber. Uh, Dr. Weber is an assistant professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst where she is also the research leader in China studies at the Political Economy Research Institute. Uh, previously, she received a PhD and an MA in economics from the New School for Social Research. And she also holds a PhD in development studies from the University of Cambridge. Uh, earlier, Dr. Weber earned a BA from the Free University of Berlin. Now today, the new book she'll be presenting, How China Escaped Shock Therapy, The Market Reform Debate, is based on a rich body of research materials, including archival sources and interviews uh, that she did with leading participants in China's economic reform process. Now, other areas of Dr. Weber's research include international trade, price and monetary theory, and the history of economic thought. And you may have also seen her writing in the media on contemporary issues ranging from inflation, uh, Bitcoin, to decoupling uh, between the US and Chinese economies. Uh, welcome, Dr. Weber. It's a, a pleasure to have you participate in today's seminar. Now, after Dr. Weber's presentation, we'll hear next uh, from Dr. Scott Rosell about the challenges that inequality in rural China present for both China and the world. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Rosell as well. Uh, Dr. Scott Rosell is the Helen F. Farnsworth Senior Fellow and the co-director of the Rural Education Action Program in the Freedom Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. He received his PhD and MS from Cornell University and his BS from the University of California, Berkeley. And today the new book that Dr. Rosell will be presenting is titled Invisible China, How the Urban-Rural Divide Threatens China's Rise, co-written with Natalie Hell, uh, which presents insights from his decades of field research across China. Uh, Dr. Rosell's research interests center on China and include agricultural policy, the emergence and development of markets and market institutions, uh, questions of distribution and equity in the reform process, and rural education, health, and nutrition. He has received numerous awards for his work, uh, more than I have time uh, to talk about this morning, uh, but I do want to highlight that he is a recipient of the Friendship Award, which is the highest honor given to non-Chinese citizens by the Chinese Premier. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rosal. It's a pleasure to have you join for today's discussion. So in the next portion of the event, uh, first Dr. Weber and then Dr. Rosal, we each give about a 20-minute presentation of their books. 
and we'll then enter the question and answer section of today's event. So all of you attending, we encourage you to ask any questions that you have. So if you do have a question, you can submit it at any time uh, in one of two ways. So you can go ahead and type your question directly into the public chat box. Uh, please do note if you submit your question in this way, it will be displayed to everyone. And now if you prefer, the second way you can ask a question is to send it directly to me uh, privately using the direct message function. If you want your question to be anonymous, please state that directly in the direct message uh, when you send me your question. We're looking forward to a lively discussion and the speakers will be doing their best to address as many of the questions you have as possible. Uh, that's all for me. Uh, Dr. Weber, welcome. Uh, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy, for this generous introduction. And thank you so much to Heidi and um, Sif for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure um, to meet you all and to be on the, this distinguished um, panel. Um, OK, let me make sure that you can see my slides. <laughs> can you see my slides? Yes? Yes. OK, great. Thank you so much. So I will try to give you a brief overview of my book, How China Escaped Shock Therapy, The Market Reform Debate. I have been myself surprised by the very wide resonance that this book has found at this specific moment. And I think it has to do with the talk about the new Cold War in a sense that at this specific moment in history, we want to go back to the end of the previous Cold War and to the turning point of the 1980s. If I'm talking about the 1980s as a turning point, um, I think it is worth taking a step back and taking a very crude measure that is GDP, that is even cruder for um, the period before the First World War or the Second World War than it is for now. But it is nevertheless, I think, a measure that gives us a broad sense of um, of, of, of the weights in the global economy. If we look at that and we plot shares in global GDP from 1820 to 2008, we can see that in 1820, China still accounted for about 33% of world GDP, which then went down to around 5% in their competing estimates um, in order to start its rise again in the 1980s. The picture for Western Europe and um, the US is pretty much the opposite. So we have a picture of a fall and rise on the part of China and a rise and fall or what looks more and more like a shrinking significance, not to talk about a fall, um, on the part of Western Europe and the United States. And I think that this tectonic shift that is underway is part of the massive tension that we are observing and in some sense leads us back to the crossroads of the 1980s, which is the bifurcation point of these two trends. We can think of the 1980s crossroads as the beginning of China's economic convergence with the West. However, this convergence in terms of economic weight did not come along with a wholesale institutional assimilation, even though China has deeply marketized. And I think that in these two parallel trends lies a lot of the origin of today's tensions. At the same time, the 1980s is the point of origin of another great divergence of what's maybe thought of as, as a great divergence, which is that between Russia's fall and China's rise, which I think can be linked to the different approaches to market reforms. It cannot be reduced to policy choices. And I want to say this very clearly and loudly. Nevertheless, I think that policy choices did matter. If we look at the outcome of market reforms in Russia, we get a picture of massive hyperinflation. Please note that this graph um, is on logarithmic scale. Inflation is here plotted in black. Um, logarithmic scale means that we could not plot this graph unless we were to take um, the scale of, of the height of a building or so if we weren't going to use that scale. This makes it look as if the evolution of GDP was mild, but in fact, the picture that emerges is one of hyperinflation and a pretty much total collapse of GDP in the 1990s. In contrast, for China, we see a picture of almost um, consistent outpacing of GDP growth um, in relation to 
inflation, with one exception in the late 1990s. So these two are really um, opposite images of the same two indicators. As I say, I am not of the opinion that this can be reduced to a policy choice. Nevertheless, I think that policy choices did matter. The policy choice that was ultimately pursued for complicated historical reasons in Russia was that of shock therapy, which was a package of reform measures that we can summarize as consisting of four elements. Liberalization of oil prices, macroeconomic austerity con to control the general price level, trade liberalization and privatization. Even the most wholehearted shock therapists were of the opinion that privatization and trade liberalization take time, which meant that the really shocking element of shock therapy was meant to be a big bang in price liberalization aided with macroeconomic austerity. Now this has this pragmatic reason of timing. It also I think has a deeper reason coming from a way of thinking about the economy where getting the prices right is a sine qua non for functioning market economy. It is fairly clear what kind of economics have underpinned um, the Russian policy choice. Whether this was with or without alternatives is a different question, but it's relatively clear what the underpinnings were. It's less clear what intellectual foundation underpinned China's economic reform approach. We know that China pursued a gradualist approach. We know that it took a different path. And we do know um, that there were exchanges that economists were involved in all of that. But it's relatively open compared to how much we know about the intellectual foundations of Russia's um, policy choice, what the intellectual foundations of China's reform approach were. And this is what I'm trying to unpack in my book. Um, and in order to do that, that, I've gone back to the first decade of China's reforms, which I'm thinking of as um, a decade that was path shaping. Of course, not everything is predetermined from the 1980s, but it did set a direction. In order to do that, as Wendy has kindly said, I've interviewed a wide range of people within China and outside of China and consulted a wide range of historical sources. One of the lines in the archival documents from the World Bank minutes um, that stuck with me was the note by a World Bank economist um, during a conference in 1982, where he's saying, why do the Chinese answer to every question that they have to go back to the liberation period policies? Which sent me on a journey trying to understand how within the Chinese system, the relationship between markets and states had been conceptualized before the re-emergence of marketization in the 1980s. In the book, I'm taking a long durée um, view. For the purpose of this presentation, I just want to emphasize that I believe that there's an important link with the policies of the 1940s, the struggle against hyperinflation of um, the communists and the attempt to use state commercial agencies in order to recreate commercial agents, uh, commercial links, and through the recreation of commerce, re-establish the value of money. In fact, Chen Yun, who must be familiar to this um, policy, said in 1950, sorry, to this audience, um, said in 1950, quote, rising prices are not good, falling prices too are not good for production. It is better to be groping for stones to cross the river more steadily. Now, it is better to be groping for stones to cross the river more steadily is probably the most famous slogan on the Chinese reform period. And it clearly dates back to the immediate post-liberation period. I cannot spell out this link in this short presentation, but I'm happy to comment on that in more detail during the Q&A. So if we go to the 1970s, we go to the beginning of reform, and we ask ourselves, why did China embark on a reform journey? There's a whole range of reasons, but I think it's important to recognize the failure of the 10-year program um, of, for a big push um, industrialization and the sheer material pressures towards finding a way for China to, um, to build the material foundation um, for its economy. Of course, the revolution was about much more than economic progress. 
Nevertheless, in the People's Daily, in the editorial on October 2nd, 1949, we can read on the ambition of the revolution, quote, to gradually change this backward agricultural country into a civilized and progressive industrial one. On the eve of reform in 1978, we can read um, say uh, documents in which Chen Yun is, is reported to have said at the CCP war conference, it has been almost 30 years since the founding of the People's Republic of China, but there are still beggars. How can this be the case? If this problem of having enough to eat is not solved, the peasants might rise in rebellion and be led to the cities by local party leaders demanding food. Of course, there was progress during the Mao era in, in, in the realm of, of education, infrastructure building, public health, and so on. And I'm sure um, Professor um, uh, Rosales is, is much better placed to comment on that than, than, than I am from a perspective of the 1980s. Nevertheless, um, the basic problem of backwardness in backwardness using the term that was used at the time did prevail. And in the interviews that I conducted with reform economists, they disagreed violently on the precise um, cause of reform. However, they agreed on the need for reform. In this context, it was also already fairly early on clear that reform should mean more market. Already in 1979, Deng Xiaoping told a foreign fo journalist saying that the market is limited to capitalism is wrong. Why can't socialism practice market economics? The big question that I think um, emerged among reform economists was not so much the ideological question of whether markets are desirable and compatible with socialism. This was an important debate that created ideological space. But among if economists, I think the key question was really how to introduce market mechanisms into a command economy. As Deng Xiaoping um, said, economics should be put in, in, in command. However, economics at the dawn of reform was shattered after the Cultural Revolution. So while reform, eco economics as an academic discipline was being reformed, um, the agricultural reforms were already in full swing. If we, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details, but if we think about the pre-reform agricultural reform setup roughly in these terms, where basically there was an exchange of a grain quota from the communes against a state set price um, from some level of central command authorities, then the logic of the agricultural reforms was to maintain this link with the center in the first place, but to allow the emergence of peripheral exchange relationships as long as this link was maintained. In order for this system to be worked out, bottom-up initiative was critical. The political initiative of people like Wanli and Zhao Ziyang was critical, but economic research that documented the initial experiments and systematized them into economic policies was another element that played an important role. In this context, um, young reform intellectuals who had spent their youth in the Cultural Revolution and returned to the cities played an important role and formed an alliance with older generation leaders. Um, and this alliance emerged as an important intellectual backbone of the agricultural reform. These people were often self-trained in Marxist classics and Maoism. They were reading um, intensely Western social sciences as it was coming out and were deeply versed in the political economy of agriculture. They took their intellectual inspiration mainly from empirical studies within China in the beginning, but later on also in Hungary, Yugoslavia, as well as post-war Germany, the UK, Brazil, and other places. This group of intellectuals initially was really um, formed through the agricultural reform, but became a voice in the market reform debate more broadly. So if we consider the question of how to introduce market um, mechanisms into a command economy, we first need to have a rough image of what the command economy looks like. So in a very heuristic sense, we can think of the command economy as being built on the ideal of one big national workshop where some level of central command authorities um, command outputs and assign inputs while also setting 
affecting prices across the system. Now, one key characteristic of this system was that the more essential an industry for the project of industrialization or the basic need of feeding the people, the more closely controlled it was um, by the state. There was another feature, which was that prices were not set to incentivize individual units, but rather were set as a redistribution mechanism across the system with low prices in the upstream industries and high prices in the downstream industries, where the high prices in the downstream industries also served as a source of fiscal revenue. After market relations emerged in the rural economy, um, through more or less a demand pull dynamic, there was a new market for retail products. So markets were emerging more or less at the margins of the old urban industrial economy in a more or less endogenous fashion. More or less, uh, furthermore, as the rural economy was also engaging in a, a, a new wave of uh, rural and industrialization with the rise of township and village enterprises, there was increasingly also demand for goods that were from the more upstream industries, such as coal, steel, and so on, that are basic inputs for any kind of industrial enterprise. So in that sense, a market um, sphere was emerging more or less endogenously, endogenously within the old system. So the big question was not whether or not to have a dual track of the coincidence of plan and market um, in, in theory, but the question was whether this endogenously emerging um, system was desirable, should be fostered, systematized, and um, um, turned into a general reform approach um, towards marketization, or whether this emergence should be suppressed. There was a 1984 youth conference that played a critical role, and I'm happy to comment on this during the Q&A. And Zhao Ziyang, once the dual track system was turned into national policy, explained to local cadres what this meant, meant. And I just want to highlight one aspect here, which is participating. After having enlivened prices by letting them go, the state had to participate in the market to regulate prices. This meant that the dual track system was based on the logic of state market participation and a co-creation of markets through states and through state and other actors. An alternative reform view that emerged in this period was that of package price reform, which is intellectually akin and draws on similar um, kinds of economics as what later came to be known shock therapy. The members of this group, very broadly speaking, were middle-aged intellectuals and young academics, often in the sciences and engineering. They had an educational background in orthodox socialist economics, often of a Soviet type, and were the first to have a, a chance to study modern economics in the US and England. They draw the drew their intellectual inspiration from the socialist speculation debate, Eastern European emigre economists like Bruce Schick and Kornai, as well as monetarists like Friedman, Chow, and the famous Erhard Miracle, as well as the, um, the post-war um, reforms in Japan. In 1982, the World Bank organized a, price, a conference with the Price Research Center, the so-called Morgan-Chan Conference, which is iconic for organizing the exchange between um, Eastern European immigrant economists and Chinese economists. The World Bank chose to bring um, Eastern European immigrants since they were versatile in, sorry, we're, we're proficient in neoclassical economics, while at the same time intimately familiar with the challenges of socialism. From this side of the debate came a, a critique of the dual track um, reform system, which suggested that the coincidence of market and plan under the dual track would create friction and contradiction an irrational um, system that in some sense might be worse than the pre-reform system and would create opportunities for inherent rent seeking and corruption. So they all argued that instead of continuing with the dual track price system, it should be abolished. Tight fiscal monetary policy should be, um, uh, uh, so should be implemented and prices should be set by calculation to some um, equilibrium level in order to then reform, uh, liberalize all prices and replace the relationships of command and order with market relationships. 
In particular, this meant letting go of the core of the old system in one big bang. In, con um, in contrast, those in favor of a, a dual track price system argued that um, if prices were let go in one big bang, given the institutional arrangement that still prevailed, that would result in hyperinflation or at least a, some sort of an upward spiral in wages and a wage price spiral. The key of the debate was not whether or not to liberalize downstream in essential prices. The key of the debate was whether or not to keep control of the industrial core of the economy and use the institutions of the plant system in order to create markets. We know how the um, debate played out. I'm not going to go through the details of the incidences when China almost um, implemented a, a, a form of Big Bang um, in, in the interest of time. And would just like to um, conclude by pointing out the logic of the two um, competing camps in the market reform debate. On the one hand, the logic of the Big Bang is based on comparative statics, on a stylized model of the old system and a theoretically derived target model, which should be um, implemented through a shock towards transition. This shock could, shock could be a one-time shock or repeated quote unquote um, gradual shock in the sense of being implemented in steps. This um, departs from the logic of complete markets as reform target, which should be achieved by destroying the plan. In contrast, the logic of, dual track, of the dual track system is that one has to start from an analysis of prevailing economic forces and institutions to identify ways to create reform dynamics at the margins and use these new dy dynamics in order to re-industrialize the whole economy without undermining stability, but ultimately um, uh, uh, recreating the structures of the economy. Market forces are here thought of as a means in a larger transformation process guided and used by the state as a tool in the interest of the state. And I think that this last statement resonates with what we are currently observing. Thank you very much. I'm happy to comment on some of the historical details that I skipped over during the Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weber, for an extremely informative and engaging presentation. If you have any questions for Dr. Weber, you may submit them now or at any time in the event for the Q&A session. And next, uh, Dr. Roselle will present on his new book. Uh, welcome, Dr. Roselle. Uh, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay, good. It's, uh, uh, that was uh, very interesting and, and sort of a... Uh, uh, the background of uh, the, uh, the the some of the material that I'm going to be giving because I'm going to skip ahead till today, um, and uh, um, you know that basically what uh, you know what was just presented very very interesting is you know the the surge <laughs> uh, the, the the ideological and policy uh, reform area surge that you know, took China from like one of the poorest countries in the world to um, at uh, least on a total GDP, right? Um, probably the second biggest economy in the world. Um, uh, what I'm gonna talk about uh, are uh, something that the market can't do and that's provide human capital. Uh, and I'm gonna show how that some of these um, failure to really invest, to make the policy decisions, to invest in human capital over the past 40, 50 years, um, perhaps uh, is going to, you know, lead China to, um, to, to a path that maybe looks like more like the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Um, uh, or Japan in the 1990s, um, maybe. So, uh, and we can talk about that later. Um, yeah, th th this is a book written with Natalie Hell. Uh, it's really a well-written book. Uh, Natalie's a good writer. <laughs> and uh, uh, so um, uh, I, I th always thank Natalie. And uh, what I do want to say is, you know, I, I, you're going to see, I'm going to argue is there's a real possibility and it's not a done deal. If, if you're an economist or if you're in a social scientist who's worked on China for 40 years, like I have, you know, you, 
you see um, the the different arguments that China's going to fail. China's going to fail, you know, from from the inflation of the '80s to the to, to Tiananmen to the Asian financial crisis in the '90s to the WTO admittance and to the global, you know, uh, depression recession of 08. And China just sort of glided through those. So uh, I. Uh, you know, I, I hope China doesn't fail. Um, uh, and this isn't a China bashing book. Um, you know, uh, you know, I think that, you know, China continuing to thrive in, you know, in the United States, <laughs> it's not always a PC, PC thing to say, politically correct thing to say. Um, I want China to succeed. Of course, I want it to be fair, cooperative, and sort of all encompassing. But it's important that they succeed for humanistic, economic, and overall good of Asia uh, uh, for many reasons. Um, so what's the invisible China? It's what I've studied, and, and I think people in this group know, right? Uh, invisible China equals rural China. Uh, 840 million people, it's you know one ninth of the world population. Out of nine people in the world, one of them resides in rural China. And you know it's the workers, the self-employed service sector. I'm going to come back to these guys uh, because uh, th this is going to be a big part of, I think, sort of identifying the weakness perhaps uh, of, of the Chinese economy uh, today. And um, uh, they run the farms. Of course, there, there, there are fewer and fewer of them, though the government wants everybody to move back there in this new rural revitalization movement. It's the elderly in the villages, the children left in the villages and the families in migrant communities. Um, I often say, you know, um, when I started working on China, rural China was not invisible. Um, 85% of Chinese lived in rural communities in 1980. Almost every family, every professor and government official were either from a, directly from a rural village or they had close family ties. They went back and forth. And if you went across the country, <laughs> you went through and lived in those villages. I, I remember it took me, took me a, a day and a half to go from Beijing to Shanghai and we stopped in these little family restaurants and, and village guest house. You know, but today we fly over them. Uh, you know, I love to take photos. I, I'm a terrible photographer. I like to take photos. Uh, you can't even take a photo on a 350 kilometer per hour high speed rail of a village. It just blurs, right? People just don't know what's going on out there. What we know is this, right? The Beijing, Shenzhen. Um, and so that's why I've sort of written this book in the invisible China, right? Um, so how does it affect... China's rise. I'm going to start with some <laughs> empirical theory, uh, um, and I'm going to. This is, uh, you know, the 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 a very very important graph, and uh, many people have seen this if they've heard me before, because it's what really motivates my my work and makes me think about what's happening, you know, in China, what's going to happening. Uh, th this graph is here's income today on the the. Um, a y axis, x axis is income uh, 60 years ago, okay, 70 years ago. And the countries down here are poor, poor. They've always been poor, right? Myanmar, Congo, right? Uh, countries like that. And here are the rich, rich countries, right? <laughs> Sweden, <laughs> Norway, uh, Canada, the United States, England, okay, that they were rich 60, high income 60 years ago, high income today. I'm interested in two sets of countries, very interested in the graduates, okay? And I want you to notice two things about this. These are countries that were middle income 30 years ago, 60 years ago, and today they're high income, okay? So um, obviously this is what China hopes to do. And I remember when I said hopes to do, China's not there yet. If you read the news, if you listen to the news, it sounds like China is already way up here, right? Um, um, you know, as you're going to see, they aren't. But two things about this. First of all, in the past 70 years, there's only been 15 countries, 15 countries and territories, <laughs> thank you, uh, that have moved up from middle income to high income, graduated. So this is not easy to do. The other thing to notice is the most recent one to do it is South Korea. And that was over 20 years ago. There hasn't been one country in 20 years that has graduated. One thing you might notice, especially with this group, uh, uh, 
there's no Eastern European countries over there. That's because Eastern European countries were uh, rich and then they joined the Soviet bloc, they became poor, now they want the middle income and then they're back there. So I didn't you know, count those, but uh, so these are the real developing countries and it's, it's not easy. Uh, the contrast is the middle income countries of the world. And you can see most of the countries are there their middle income for 70 years, right? And it's not that they're in nice little equilibrium and happy, you know, that they grow, 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 collapse. They grow and stagnate. And when they grow and collapse, uh, we may not feel it in Europe or uh, United States, but when that comes, there's lots of people in those countries that get hurt and, uh, uh, and then they revise and resubmit and then and try to keep going. So um, so th this is, uh, you know, the difference I want to try to think about is, right, is, you know, why, what is the difference between these two types of countries? And one fundamental difference between them, th there, are, there are others for sure, but at the time when these countries were at middle income, um, the levels of human capital of the entire labor force was very high. So when I say entire labor force, I mean people from 18 to 65. So not just not, not just the 18 to 20 year olds, but the whole labor force. That the, the labor forces in these countries were already really high when they were middle income. Okay. Um, and um, you know, so let's see this. So, so these are the OECD countries. So these are the rich, rich clubs. They were they're up in the right hand corner up there. Um, seven or eight, seven or eight out of ten people in the whole labor force in a high income country like the the U.S. So eighty percent of our um, labor force has uh, attended high school. We has finished high school. Uh, we have twenty percent dropouts. Right. Um, uh, and so that's, that's high income. So, but let's look at those middle income grads. So these are the countries that graduated there. At the time they were middle income, they already had high level countries of human capital, okay? So the, the whole labor force was, had the skills as they moved into high income to switch jobs, to participate in these high income, high technology, uh, rapidly shifting economies, okay? And, and now you need some people that, you know, uh, do the, continue to do the low labor work in there, but most of the people in successfully growing countries have already at least have the math, the science, the, the computer skills, the language skills that they can participate in a high income economy. Okay, so that's, that's what I do. Let's look at the trapped, okay? That's where most of those countries are in the middle. The Turkeys, the Brazils, Argentina, Mexico, South Africa, three out of 10 or four out of 10. That means seven, six or seven out of 10 people in those countries have, have never been to high school. They, 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 they don't have math or science or, or, or computer skills. And, and how do you participate in an economy? You know, in the United States today, if you're not a high school grad, okay, there's a five times more probability of you being on welfare, in jail, um, on, uh, on drugs, <laughs> uh, in disability, um, uh, and, you know, having, a, a, you know, a, a broken life versus having a middle income life, five to one, you do not want to be a high school dropout in the United States. Um, and, and of course, you know, that, that's what's happening in, in, in some of these countries as they, as they came to more. You can see that middle income grads had education levels twice that of middle income uh, tracked countries, okay? Um, so just to summarize, when a country moves from middle income to high income, wages rise fast. Aha, wages rose fast in China from 2000 to 2015, right? From, and when you go from low wage to high wage, low skill to high skill, um, if the large share of the labor force isn't able to participate in this new uh, economy, you're going to get a polarization, right? You're going to get some that are going to do well and others that, that, that aren't. Um, and that's going to lead to an unemployment and informality. I'm going to talk a lot about this in a second. High crime, social unrest, um, 
uh, you know, you don't think of any of these, <laughs> you don't think of any of these in terms of the Chinese economy today, uh, hardly. And but I'm going to say that this is a distinct possibility as they go forward. If that happens, that ha that hurts productivity. It brings down growth. You know that there's a a, a stagnation, a polarization, in a vicious circle that you know leads to a economy um, um, sort of stagnating or collapsing. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so that's that's theory. Let's look where China is today. Okay, um, here's China, clearly in the middle income uh, uh, group. You know, moving up. <laughs> yes, they've moved up a long ways from that forty five degree line. Right? They they were almost poor. Um, uh, uh, you know, they they were quite poor in nineteen sixty. But today, they're you know, of course, they want to move up to to, to this level here. Okay, um, so summarizing above, all kids don't need to go to college now. Uh, in a in a country, all people in the labor force don't need to be in college. But you know, if you go into a high income country like China is trying to become, I think I think the data show that that. All the labor force, not just the children, I should say children slash labor force members, should it be have a high school education. It's at this critical stage that they get the skills they learn. I've now said it three times. So where is China? When I give this next phrase to, to in China, I don't care if it's Tsinghua or to a group of uh, of uh, Chamber of Commerce people in Shanghai or to a philanthropy conference in Shenzhen, people sort of, they, they gasp or they, they shake their heads. China is the lowest educated country in the entire middle income world. Number one, <laughs> low. And you can say China is the lowest country, right? You know, you're, you're talking to people in Tsinghua, right? And, I, and, and then they said, where do you get your data, Professor Roselle? Well, you know, I collect data. I, I, I do a tremendous amount of field work, but this data is not mine. <laughs> this data is from this little census of 1.3 billion people, right? And in that census, they ask people, what is your level of education, right? And, and everybody, so th there's a 50-year-old, some 50-year-olds, not many, said, I've never been to school. I just graduated from, I, I went to some primary school, I did some middle school, this is through ninth grade, and you can see high school, college, university, and when you take that out, it's only 30%, okay? So, so in China, out of 10 workers, this is out of, you know, 900 million, right? <laughs> out of 900 million workers, only three out of 10 have ever been to one day of high school, okay? All the rest are junior high or junior high dropouts. Okay, that's that's China's this magical labor force, right? And how does that compare to the rest of the world? You know, this is what people shake their head. China's education level. This is an OECD metric, right? The share of human cap, the share of the labor force that's been in the high school is lower than South Africa. It's lower than Turkey. It's lower than Mexico, right? And and if this is important for countries to continue to thrive as they move into high income, uh, China is in trouble, <laughs> okay? And uh, um, so, um, so what does this mean? It means that, seven, why is it a trouble? 70% of those are, yeah, I call them high school dropouts, <laughs> okay? But they aren't even high school dropouts. In, in the Chinese census, that means they haven't even attended one day of high school. Of course, there, there isn't a lot of dropout in high school. There's a lot of dropout in middle school in China, at least there used to be. But um, uh, there's not. So this means 70 percent, 0.7, 600 million people, you know, don't have the math, language, computer skills that if China rises to a middle income, to a high income level and their economy transforms into a, a modern technological based uh, uh, economy is, I think that there's gonna, that, that there's gonna be a huge number of people who aren't gonna be able to participate in, to be, to contribute to it, okay? So the, the only, the thing I'm gonna end with, I'm gonna keep this very short, um, um, yeah, 20 minutes. I, <laughs> it's not easy. I, I know I, um, uh, I wanted the, the other speaker to keep going because it's so interesting, but I'm just going to give you one thing. Is there any evidence that's this affecting the Chinese economy today? Okay. And again, 
I want to look at government data, which may be, you know, I think that it would err on the side of conservatism, right? That, that it wouldn't be. But I want to look at two key indicators in the Chinese economy today, employment and wages, okay? And again, this is using, this is government statistics on the whole economy. And what I want you to look at here is this graph, and I think it's extremely interesting and important. Um, it's from 2004 till today, almost uh, 2017. And what you see is look, look at look at here in 2004. This is sort of at the apex of of the reforms right after they entered WTO that that we heard about in the previous um, uh, presentation. Um, at, at this time, seven out of ten, nearly seven out of ten people in the labor force were part of the formal employment scheme. So, by the way, this is uh, tertiary, uh, secondary and tertiary um, employment. So agriculture is not in there, okay? So this is just people in manufacturing, construction, and service sector. Think of it that way. But at that time, in 2004, almost everyone, or seven out of 10 people, um, belong to a done way, belong to a unit, okay? They were covered by employment laws. Um, they had social security, they had services, right, from, from their done way. Um, and they, they were part of it, right? Um, but look at today, over the last 20 years or 15 years, that's gone down to reverse. Six out of 10 have now been relegated to the informal sector, okay? You can see these informal jobs rise, look at this, and informal jobs in China are now going down. Oh my gosh, this, this sounds like the United States in the 1980s, right? So are we at this turning point as China tries to move to high income and you've got this enormous <laughs> um, uh, un un uneducated labor force they, they can't be in these formal sector jobs. They just don't have the skills to do it. And let's look at employment. I think this is even more, more interesting. I, I think this is one of the most important graphs here. It's, it's what's happening. Look, well, look what's happening over the past 10 years almost. Manufacturing is now falling, okay? Wow, sounds like Europe and the United States, you know, uh, through the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Construction is topped out. It's actually falling now uh, in the last couple of years. Um, the good news is, is look at skill intensive jobs, right? <laughs> Investors, doctors, uh, uh, professors, right? Are rising. Okay. That's good. Okay. That's, that's, that's a healthy cut. But what is rising twice or three times as fast are informal labor intensive service sector. It's rising extremely fast. <laughs> it's, these people from manufacturing, when they get laid off their jobs, they get dumped over here. Construction, they jump dumped over here. New entrants to the labor force get dumped over there. And so we get this, this huge informal labor intensive service sector, right? That, that, that's growing fast. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if, if the demand for services is growing as fast, but, but look what's happening here. This is a little hard to see. I've summarized it here is wages in the formal, this is of doctors and, and investors and managers and uh, the, 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 the white collar sector, wages are going up um, uh, and they're rising at a rising rate. That's good news, but look what's happening to the informal sector. My colleague, my colleague uh, Lee Hong Bean wrote a paper called The End of Cheap Wages. Uh, and it was a paper written in 2015 where he showed through the 1990s uh, 2000s, 2015, wages in of the unskilled sector were rising faster than GDP. Those days are gone. You can see now wages are starting to fall. We see this sort of polarization happening uh, out here in the labor force. Um, why are wages falling? Well, you have a rising supply of informal workers. <laughs> okay, everybody's getting dumped into this sector. Uh, employment in other sectors, manufacturing, construction, agriculture is falling. These laid off workers and workers from these other sectors have one option, the informal sector. It, you, know, uh, you know, China wants a rise of domestic demand, but obviously it's not rising fast enough to keep wages from falling, okay? And um, what's driving these trends, these will be the last set of slides that I show, um, you know, it's robots and automation. Um, it's 
globalization, right? Um, uh, you know, um, I, I, if I if I stood up, if I was in person, I'd step from behind the podium and show you my my Levi jeans, right? And there's a little tag that says "Made in Ethiopia." Five years ago, it was made in China, right? Samsung puts everything together in Vietnam. No, now you don't see many Chinese firms out there, right? Of course not. That's because they're getting government subsidies to automate, 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 automate. That's the number one word. But, you know, wages are rising. But you know, that's good that those firms are going to stay in China from China's perspective. But that doesn't help the workers. These workers on this line. They aren't unskilled workers that you know never went to high school. They they're computer science majors from a vocational college, right? That's who has to work in China's factories today. Um, and and of course we have COVID and the global recession. Should we expect more in the future? Right there they go. Right, look at China's investing in robots. <laughs> China has installed more robots and more automation than, uh, than Germany, South Korea, Japan, and North America combined. Okay, China and 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 some of it is is funded by the factories themselves, but a lot of it is subsidized by the government. And and that that, that that's not bad. They say I want to keep the firms here, but um, uh, there and the global supply chains are obviously continuing to shift. Um, Chinese firms may not be able to move out of China, but but international firms are. So, should we expect more of this? I think for sure. You know, that maybe, probably. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll, I'll you know put some. Uh, in. So, the challenges for the government, and this is in conclusion, is twofold. They have to get all the students and all the laid off workers in this informal sector into job training. Um, and and to increase their uh, their basically skill set so they can participate in this economy, okay? Um, you remember, the, you know, you don't think the Chinese government isn't aware of this? I, I, about a year ago, Li Keqiang came out and said, "I'm worried about the 600 million people that he called the the Tan Fan Jingji, right? The 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 informal sector, basically, it was the, the 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 flea market sector, the people who are, you know, uh, riding their bicycles around delivering goods, opening little mom and pop shores, little repair guys collecting trash, uh, you know, I'm worried about there. He said there's 600 million people that earn a thousand yen per uh, um, uh, uh, month or less, okay, that's 600 million people are there and, and um, the, the trouble is, is not only getting them into this high schools and job training, I, I, my, the rest of my book is how they aren't learning anything in the school system. It's, it's about when they go there, are they ready to learn to even get those skills? And, and if you read the book, you're going to see that the level of rural education, the quality is so low that they get into high school and they can't learn, right? That these adults get into adult training program when they're laid off and they don't learn. I think that that how do we deal with that? Um, it's going to be there's a large share of people that don't have the skills to learn how to learn. I think you know if China doesn't figure this out, um, th th that there's going to be a problem. If they do figure it out, what they have to do is make a huge investment in the human capital. You know, <laughs> is the U.S. going to put three trillion dollars in the human capital? I, I never think it's going to pass. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Congress in the U.S. I, I hope it does. <laughs> it needs it. China needs to pr to put more into human capital. Their human capital, as you see, is much much worse than the the, the U.S. Um, they need to put a safety net for those whom it's too late. Okay, and are they going to do that? You know. They want to build a high-speed rail to every single county in China. Why you need a high-speed rail to every county in China, right? Let people take a bus. Okay, um, so I, I'm going to end there. You know, um, you, you know, this is China's future. It, it starts right here. Um, uh, I, we can talk about it later. I I think that you know, if people ask me. So what do you think? Uh, is China going to look more like the Philippines in 2035 or Japan? 
and I say, you know, you take your choice. You listen to my seminar. <laughs> you know, uh, you can decide. I think that if there's even a five percent probability, a ten percent, a twenty percent probability of what I said is is true, um, I think that these huge investments that I'm I'm suggesting that that China makes from from rural education to rural health to early childhood development, uh, it's totally totally worth it. It's insurance. Uh, for e even though you may not need to do it right, um, is that it's worth doing. I'm going to quit right there. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Barzell, for your presentation on these critical and also under examined issues and for helping us to learn more about the invisible China. Uh, so it's time now for the Q&A portion of today's event. We have about 30 minutes, so we should be able to cover a lot of questions. I'll start the discussion with several questions for each speaker, and then we'll open it up to the audience. I've had a lot of great questions coming in already um, from the chat box and private message. So please continue to send your questions uh, for both of the speakers now. So the first question I have is for Dr. Baber. And we see that international actors and ideas are a key element in your account of China's market reform debates. In addition to the study tours from China to Europe and Latin America, as well as the World Bank delegations you talked about today, the book um, you know, also discusses these in greater detail. We know in addition that from the late 1970s through the 1980s, Chinese leaders as well invited foreigners to serve as economic advisors to the state council, including experts from Japan, West Germany, and later Singapore as well. We also know that diaspora linkages with Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Southeast Asia facilitated these exchanges of people and ideas across borders. So from these types of examples and the ones that you give in the book, it seems that international actors play a very important role in China's market reform debate. But on the other hand, in the book, I think more than today's presentation, you also give us some important examples about foreign experts' lack of understanding of China's actual conditions. And you also describe how Chinese reformers sometimes uh, very strategically and selectively were able to use foreign experts' assessments in order to get more support for their own preferred approaches. Also, sometimes certain international actors would be very popular and then later uh, they would fall from favor in China. So my question is, how do you think that we should understand the role of international engagement in, in China's reform debates and reform process? Did it really have a consistent and genuine influence or would you say that its effects were more selective, uh, maybe more superficial, and indeed secondary to what Chinese reformers themselves found in their own study and their own reflection on China's conditions? Thank you so much for this great question, which allows me to um, extend more in some of the elements that I brushed over during my presentation, trying to um, illustrate a certain logic of, of reform um, in, in, in the, illustrating two competing logic of reform. So I absolutely do think that there has been a consistent influence. I think that thinking of either it's all made abroad and simply imported, copied by China, um, is, is clearly not right. It's also not right um, to say that everything has simply been invented in China. So I think both of these positions, either China has just copied from abroad or it's all simply um, grown out of Chinese soil and therefore it's exclusively Chinese end of story. I think either of these two poles are um, not getting it right. Um, the way that I'm, I've been um, trying to think about it is that at each step along the way in China's reform policy making, there have been very clear um, problems that were faced. I think that uh, Professor Roussel's presentation just um, presented another very clear problem that China is, uh, is, is facing right now. And there have been a, a whole series of fundamental problems that emerged in the process of um, reform policy making. And that at, at each of these critical junctures, at each moment when an important question emerged, and in the early years of reform, this was a very foundational question, it was really the question of how to create markets, how to move from one broad system to another system. And then as reform evolved, these questions became more and more specific. Now, at each of these moments, I think there have been there has been um, an, an interaction between 
foreign ideas, foreign experiences, and um, Chinese uh, researchers, economists, and government officials um, trying to make sense of these foreign experiences and interpreting them on their own terms. So in that sense, these exchanges are anything but inconsequential. At the same time, it's not a one directional explanation where it is there was this one brilliant person who came from country X, <laughs> visited China, dropped an idea, and that solved the problem. That's not the way the system works. I think that the system works in a way that competing ideas are being considered, competing experiences of different countries are being considered, are being studied by various institutions within the system in a very systematic fashion, and then certain conclusions are being reached. Um, I think one of the interviews with a World Bank official who was on the very first China mission and was quite il illuminating to me, where he was illustrating that while China translated the first World Bank study that was published in 1983, but um, con the, the, the research was conducted earlier, it took a while until they settled on a version. This study was translated into Chinese. It was circulated at every level of um, reform policy making. It was um, given to officials as a reading that should be consulted. But the cover of the study was designed in a way that clearly set it apart from internal studies. So anyone who would see that study would know this is important. This comes from the highest level. This is to be considered, but it's not our study. Um, so as he was saying in that same interview, um, this was a relationship of highly professional interaction, taking each other, other's viewpoints seriously, but not a situation of um, simply taking on board um, advice that was presented in an unmediated way. And I think that in some sense, this process is still going on. And it often happens that foreigners go to China, they are part of very high level meetings, they articulate their ideas, it, take, it gets some traction, they come back and they feel like I have solved the Chinese problem. I think that <laughs> this is part of um, also a certain politeness on the part of the Chinese <laughs> um, hosts often that, that can reside in a flattering that might um, create sometimes slightly misleading inter interpretations. But this is not to say that this visit was irrelevant or that it did, didn't have consequences. Uh, thank you so much for that answer. I think that's very helpful to give a, a more comprehensive and a complex and, and therefore more, more accurate account of the role of international experts uh, in China's reform debates and process. I'll ask you just one more question, and then I have two questions as well for Dr. Rosell. And then we have a lot of great questions coming in. Please continue to send them in uh, to me as well. So my second question is, you know, one of the really valuable contributions of your book is that it provides important new insights into the changing thinking of, of price on price reform of some top Chinese leaders uh, like Zhao Ziyang, for example. Now, understandably, it's a lot more challenging to conduct research about the evolution of Deng Xiaoping's thinking about price reform. We haven't had the same availability of historical materials in recent years to be able to get uh, new insights onto that. Um, but we do see in your book how critical Deng Xiaoping's views become, especially in 1988, when his urging of price reform results in a major jump in the price of key agricultural goods in April of that year. So to the extent that you're able, uh, what can you tell us about any key influences and, and turning points in Deng Xiaoping's thinking about price reform during the 1980s? Yeah, um, thank you so much for this question. I mean, as you have pointed out, it is much, much, much more difficult um, since, I mean, maybe that that gives me an occasion to also point to the amazing resource in terms of the Zhao Ziyang Wenji, the collected works of Zhao Ziyang that has been published, and that really is a terrific collection of documents um, that we can now read in simplified <laughs> Chinese, um, which, which is just giving us, I, I mean, opening a whole new world into, um, into the internal discussions um, amongst the leadership, which of course, something like this is not available on Deng Xiaoping. So let me just try to emphasize the moment in 1988. There has been a lot of controversy over what exactly happened in 1988. Clearly things did get out of control in 1988. Clearly, prices for the first time um, did start to rise very quickly. Whether we want to call this hyperinflation or not, probably it's not correct to call it hyperinflation. But we have to remember that China was 
um, experiencing what amounted to about a 28% annual increase in prices um, against a backdrop of an economy that had, um, according to Xiu Mutia, one of China's most important economies of the 20th century, possibly the most stable prices um, in the post-war period. So whether this is exactly true or not, prices were extremely stable and people were not used to depending on price movements and to depending on prices at all for their daily livelihoods, right? So against that backdrop, a sudden very fast increase in prices is enormously unsettling. I mean, against the background of the current inflation debate, if someone was predicting 28% um, inflation for next year. <laughs> um, it would be interesting how the reaction would be. So the point being that there was a spiraling out of prices, there was a spiraling out of control. So the question then it becomes why? One of the accounts suggests that basically Zhao Ziyang was the driving force, that there was a delegation that went to Latin America, in particular to Brazil, that met with Delphine Neto, who was the um, architect of the Brazilian economic miracle, and that came back basically saying inflation is not a problem. Let's not worry about rising prices. Let's just go ahead with reform as before and let's go ahead with price reform quickly. I don't find this account um, entirely convincing because in 1986, Zhao Ziyang was the one who took initiative towards very rapid price liberalization and he really burned his fingers. He set up a whole institute. He um, got people from across ministries, very high ranking people be part of that institute to develop a plan for rapid price liberalization, tax and wage reform. And he made a complete U-turn stopping his own initiative in 1986. So would it really be Zhao Ziyang who takes the initiative in 1988 to push through price reform? My sense is rather not. <laughs> My sense is that the political dynamic between the so-called conservatives, um, where I think some nuance is needed, but as a, as a shortcut, we can call them conservatives, um, and um, Deng Xiaoping was becoming so tense in 1988, which was an expression of marketization, having, having moved a far ahead to um, really um, the, the, the core of the system, which was something that some people in the leadership did not want to happen. So you had this massive tension on that level. At the same time, the so-called golden years of reform that um, created a, a sense of everybody is simply winning um, were starting to come to a close. In fact, for the rural population in 1988, um, there, there's also the first moment where in some places, real incomes actually started to fall. So you get a situation where the sense of reform simply being a uh, win for all um, is, is starting to fade out and social and political tensions are mounting. In this situation, my reading is that Deng Xiaoping himself is taking the initiative since he is trying to find a way out of the um, price conundrum since corruption under the dual track system is becoming rampant. And he's trying to rescue the project of market reform, trying to push ahead. But once things get too hot, he takes a U-turn. So in that sense, in 1986, Zhao Ziyang burns his fingers on that question. In 1988, Deng Xiaoping burns his fingers on that question. And we get the kind of policy reversal that happens in late 1988 and prepares the ground for what then happens in 1989. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that answer. I, I do hope for all of our sake that in the future, there's more historical documents uh, so we can learn even more details about this period. Now, for Dr. Roussel, you know, as I was thinking about your book and thinking about the title of your book uh, in the context of current events, it seems that the COVID-19 pandemic has made invisible China even more invisible. Uh, so for us who are outside of China, it's even more invisible you know, for you and perhaps many me members of your research team because travel to China is basically halted and domestic travel within China and migration have also been either restricted or discouraged at various stages of the pandemic. So during China's pandemic response, we've seen that some local governments and urban employers have been using HUCO or household registration as a tool to either limit or selectively manage migrant populations in urban areas. And you discuss in your book how the informal economy's low barriers to access 
um, make it more attractive for many people. And remember early on in the pandemic, Chinese premier Li Keqiang even suggested that reviving a stall economy of street vendors could help to address uh, unemployment concerns. So what have you and your research team learned about development since 2020 for people in the Chinese countryside uh, with regard to migration and employment uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues? Uh, thanks, uh, Wendy. Um, uh, it's a, a, a good big question. I'm, I'm gonna basically have two quick, two quick answers. Um, one is, of course, uh, yes, uh, COVID has hurt China's economy, uh, not like the rest of the world, right, <laughs> as much. Uh, certainly in the early days, um, uh, what, what we actually did, four rounds of surveys, they were phone call surveys to um, 750 randomly selected village informants. So these were these were individuals that had been in our previous surveys, uh, and they were, were not leaders and they weren't party members. They were just parents of kids that were in our education programs that lived in the village. And we asked them to talk about their villages. And believe me, in February and March of 2020, there was a, uh, the, the unemployment rate went to uh, 80%. <laughs> um, so 80% of of uh, rural people that were not working, right? They were sitting at home uh, and they had zero, <laughs> zero um, uh, unemployment benefits, right? And uh, um, that there was lots of concern. Of course, what they did was they, they, they responded by reducing consumption, uh, by drawing on savings and, and everything. Um, I think fortunately, right, for China, they got that that this supreme crackdown. And and the other thing is is out of these 700 villages that covered this area um, uh, uh, of seven different provinces, uh, there were nine cases of COVID in six villages and zero deaths. Um, so there was zero impact there. What we then find as we 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 then surveyed them again in uh, late April and then in August. Um, people went back to work and uh, uh, they went back slowly to work and many people stayed home because, you know, just like in the U.S., uh, you had kids that the schools didn't reopen or they reopened and their kids were having as a problem. So many, many females didn't go back to work. Um, uh, and it, though by August, you started to see mostly recovery. But by August, the unemployment rate is probably down, you know, China says it's down to 4%. That's because no rural person is ever unemployed, right? Unemployed means you don't have access to any income. Um, that's the definition. And every single rural family has a plot of land. So if you have a plot of land, you have a source of income, you can't be unemployed. So they're never, <laughs> this is by, this is by definition, but 20, 20, it was still about, about 20% of people who had had a job in 2019, uh, didn't have a job then. Um, now that I'm sure that those 20%, many of them have gone back to work. But the main thing that I want to say is when they went back to work, uh, for the 80% that had been unemployed and went back to work, they were working at jobs that, remember, these weren't in my data, but their wage rates fell much, much further. And they were much more into the stall vendor uh, economy or the informal economy. And so you, you saw this, these changes uh, going, and many employers took advantage of this this shift to 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 make more of their actually even in factory workers informal so they contracted out to contractors who went out and found labor and brought it in but the the contractors and the 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 workers that work for them there's not a formal contractual employment they're informal workers they can come and go they don't get uh, the, the the total benefit so so covid-19 had you know continued impact on that i think the the main the bigger issue is let's look at two. Let's look at the four. You know the 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 the, the fourteen five year plan. The the plan through twenty thirty five, and they're exactly what you said, Wendy. Uh, that there's a plan 
not to let them come back into the city. Hey, you know, and then China says, no, we're going to urbanize everybody, right? So we're not going to let them go to the big cities, but we're going to urbanize, which means um, their, their plan is to urbanize these fourth and fifth tier cities, okay? So in, in the United States, if you're from the United States, I call this um, uh, the, the creation of 2000 Cincinnati's. Okay, yes, and why do I say that? Cincinnati is a city of 200,000 people. Uh, now, Cincinnati is also a, is, is a city with about 30% unemployment. <laughs> um, it, it, and it has a mix of people who are working and lots and lots of people who, who are in the informal economy or not working at all. But that's what China wants to do is they wanna go to their 2000 county seats and create 2000 cities of 200,000 people. That's where the 400 million rural workers are going to go. And I, I just, you know, wh whether it happens or not, it's, it's happening right now. And that's where you people now, and there's a short term benefit of providing better social services to them. That's for sure. But in the longer run, what's the economy of, you know, a 200,000 um, uh, city in, you know, Southern Hubei province or Northern um, uh, Anhui province? What, what do you do you don't have manufacturing, you, you know, construction's gonna top out and everybody there is low income and they aren't gonna be low people with low income. They aren't poor, right? There's no poverty in China, <laughs> right? Uh, but these, these poor, low income people don't consume services. So you have these economies where there's no demand for anything. So what are people gonna do? I, I think that, that this is gonna be the really interesting uh, part of this new plan that rolls out. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical, um, so. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to skip my second question because I've had three people ask the same question. So I think that is a high priority question uh, that I'd like to raise for you. Uh, so Joseph Hongsheng Zhao from University of Cambridge, uh, Philip Stolle and M. Scott are, are all asking a, a similar question. Uh, which basically is how does education level and or participation in the formal economy vary by age? And so for example, we could assume that younger generations are more likely to have completed high school. So if we exclude people who are 50 or older who will soon exit the workforce, how does this affect your analysis? Are there significant differences that you've identified across generations? Sure, sure. It, it, it's it's very important um, uh, question. And the, the fact is, is if if I would have had, uh, you know, I saw I actually took uh, 24 minutes. <laughs> Sorry about that. If I'd had uh, uh, five more minutes, I, I have a set of slides that basically says, does China know that there's a problem, right? Um, in other words, does, does the, you know, I, 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 this is a secret problem that only Scott knows about. <laughs> you know, the answer is no, right? I think the Chinese government is fully aware of it. Uh, I don't think they understand the roots of the problem, which starts at zero to three, and it's the quality of the rural education system. But I think they realize that they don't have enough educated people. And, and in response, over the past 10 or 15 years, they've rapidly expanded high school. Um, now, they've done it by expanding uh, vocational education rather than academic high school. And I say that's perfectly fine, right? I mean, as long as the quality of vocational uh, high school is, is high, which it's not, but you know, it's probably because they expanded so fast. They, they really need to get the quality down right. Um, uh, they need to get the quality. <laughs> They've been doing rural education for 70 years and they haven't got that right yet. Um, so, but, but, but that's, that's a separate issue. So I think the Chinese government knows it. And I think that the younger cohorts have um, uh, risen. Okay. Um, but the younger, this didn't start until 15 years ago. So yes. So if you look at 25 year olds, 50% um, of them, 55% of them have been to high school. Okay. Uh, maybe 60% of them, something like that, okay? Uh, but if you look at 35-year-olds, okay, it's only 20% of them, okay? It, it's really low for 35. And 35 years old, 45, 55, 65, they're going to be there for 30 more years. So this isn't until 2050, 
that we have to deal with those people. This isn't going on, you know, and, and so so that, that's that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is, is um, if we remember, that was the second part of my slide. If we get these kids into high school, are they going to learn? And um, this is way, way too complicated, but the, the short end of the story is I've been working on rural education for about 15 years, and we started looking at problems in high school. And we did all these sort of interesting programs to try to improve high school education, and nothing happened. So we said, oh, well, maybe we should go to junior high. And we did things in junior high, nothing happened. So then we went to rural, we went to, to, to primary school. We did find some things that would happen that would work like uh, better nutrition, uh, eyeglasses, deworming. And we figured out how to take this gap, oops, where is that? <laughs> this gap from rural to urban and shrink it by that much. But there was still a huge difference. Why is there this difference? Well, you know, what we ended up doing is going to babies zero to three. And we just published a paper in British Medical Journal, a systematic review of all the papers written on rural China development of babies. And guess what? In 18 separate studies by 18 groups, and these aren't in minority areas, these are in Henan, Hebei, uh, Shanxi, Anhui, 50% uh, of rural kids, 47% of rural babies are underdeveloped, that they have cognitive skills and language skills that are abnormally low. And if you don't get it right, you know, Chinese have a saying, San Sui Kan Lao, at three, we can see the future. Um, uh, if you don't get that right, they're not going to do well. And that's happening today. I mean, I mean, not, not. Today. So I think China has a huge human capital problem. Um, you know what? The United States has a hu huge human capital problem. So I'm, I'm not criticizing China as this foreigner, right? Uh, but I think that that's what the numbers show. So uh, I, I don't think this is going away. I think the Chinese government knows there is a problem. I don't think they know where the roots of the problem are or how much effort needs to be put into it to improve it. Thank you so much. Uh, certainly, this is a very difficult problem with long time horizon, um, both in origin and potential solution. Uh, turning back to Dr. Weber, uh, we have a question from uh, Fan Shutao at Beijing Normal University. And he writes, Alexander, Karen Cross, and Wu Jinglian all hope for tight macroeconomic policy in China for price reform. And Shui Mutiao based his policy suggestions about price reform, uh, as you discuss in the book, on the revolutionary economy in the 1940s when he helped to maintain low inflation with tight monetary policy. So a two-part question. At first, do you think that macroeconomic policy was tight in the late 1980s? And second, if you had been responsible for China's macroeconomic policy during the 1980s, uh, what changes might you have suggested to the approach? Okay, great question. Thank you, Fan Shita, and uh, greetings to um, 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 Beijing Normal University. Um, Fan Shita is someone who has helped me a lot with interviews. Thank you so much, Fan Shitao, and thanks for joining. Um, on the question of the macroeconomic policy situation in 1988, um, so as I'm arguing in the book, in the um, chapter just before the, uh, before the conclusion, I'm suggesting that basically the policy that was taken almost in 1988 was a policy that was inconsistent with both sides of the debate in the sense that those who were urging for more rapid price liberalization actually thought that the macroeconomic conditions were not right. Whereas those who were in principle against um, rapid price liberalization in the core of the economic system um, were obviously also opposed to this policy. So in other words, um, the kind of decision that was taken um, was in principle, um, inspired by the idea that price liberalization would be important, but the timing was not consistent with those who were arguing erratically for price liberalization. This is why I'm focusing in my explanation on, the, on 1988 on these political and social dynamics that I think created a kind of pressure that led Deng Xiaoping to trying to, as he says, crush through the gates of price reform, um, taking 
big risk, um, facing the risks head on and all of that, even though this was not congruent with the economic policy advice provided by either side. The second question I would rather abstain from answering. Um, I've tried um, in my work um, to interview a wide range of people who are coming at these questions um, from very different backgrounds, both personally in terms of their age, in terms of their education, in terms of their trajectories during the Cultural Revolution, in terms of the kind of economics that, were, that they were studying, in terms of the kind of institutes that they were placed at um, during the reform period, in terms of the kind of economic policies that they were involved with before they entered the price reform debate. And I, I see it as my job trying to um, show both sides of this debate. Um, I do think that um, pushing through with price reform in 1988 would have been um, very problematic, um, but this is not to say that I would have had the right solution for, 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 for what should have happened in the 1980s. Since you mentioned Alec Cancross, I'd like to point out that while Alec Cancross was, of course, already mentioned in previous works and prominently in Julian Gewurz's important book, um, in the chapter on the um, Bashanlun conference in my book, um, I do engage in quite some detail with the arguments presented by Alec Cancross in his own memoirs, which I got from the Glasgow archives. And I haven't seen these economic arguments that um, Kent Cross is jotting down in his own <laughs> diary um, being used somewhere else. So if anyone is interested in the views of Alec Kent Cross, I think there is some new insights in my book. I think that Alec Kent Cross is absolutely important since he was in charge of the post-war British economy, where after the war, the challenge of how to move from a more or less command war economy to a market economy was similar on some level, of course, not identical, not at all identical, but there were similar challenges involved to moving from a command economy to a market economy in the context of socialist transitions. So therefore, I think that Alec Cancross voice is an important one. Um, and this is also part of the reason why I've included a whole chapter on post-World War II transitions and the debates around that in the context of Europe and the US. Thank you, Fan Chetau, for your great question. Thank you very much. So we have uh, time for one more question for Scott. Um, I do apologize, we have so many questions. It's, it's always such a challenge uh, to be able to fit them all into a short time. Um, but I appreciate all the questions I have raised and I, I wanna provide one more to Scott from a Yu Fei from the City University of Hong Kong. And Yu Fei asks, how might changes in China's demographics, uh, specifically falling birth rates affect the trends and challenges in rural China that you identify? Yeah, um, I, I think I actually had lunch yesterday with um, uh, a, a person in China who's been really uh, very, very much uh, involved with uh, getting rid of the one-child policy and you know pushing towards. Um, yeah, you know, he he said the three-child policy wouldn't be any use because nobody nobody fought, uh, responded to the two-child policy, right? Uh, and he's very much for providing you know, stimulations, so stimulants uh, 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 to try to induce people to have more kids. Um, yeah, um, sure, you know, what it's going to mean is there's going to be less people, you know, to, to work and there's going to be, you know, fewer people in the, you know, in the in, informal economy, in the formal economy. Um, it's going to be a long, long, you know, term. We're going to, we're going to see this again in 2050, right? That's, that's when we're going to, uh, do this. So the question is: Is can China survive to 2050? Um, that, you know, that's that's one thing. So I, I think that there's there's huge implications for uh, falling uh, demography that we don't even quite understand. Uh, we you can look at glimpses of uh, Japan and uh, glimpses of South Korea and Taiwan to see you know how how it's playing out. Uh, but um, you know, in a country the size of China, that so that that's number one. Um, number two is you know, um, that when you have fewer people, you better make sure those fewer people all, you know, are well educated, right? And, uh, and that they have the human capital that that they need to, to push society forward. Um, and, um, you know, it's, 
urban birth rates that are the lowest and rural birth rates, which are, they're still, they fall, the rural birth rates have fallen. I mean, but on average, they're still having two plus kids each. And that's gonna, that's going to be your, your your labor force in the future. So the, it means more emphasis on rural education, early childhood development, and health. Uh, I, I didn't even get into rural health. Um, the, the rural health problems are extremely, uh, very complicated. And um, uh, all, all I can say, you uh, we're working with the University of North Carolina. If you get sick in rural China don't go to the doctor, <laughs> get out of rural China, because the probability of you being hurt uh, uh, is higher than the probability of you being helped. Um, and so um, uh, I'll, I'll leave it right there. But uh, I think that basically the following demography, uh, the, the, the falling trends in, in demography, birth rates and everything mean that the, the idea of human capital and the quality of the labor force has to take even a more uh, a higher profile um, uh, uh, in, in policymakers um, uh, in, in their areas of emphasis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, so we had a number of additional questions uh, for both Dr. Roselle and Dr. Weber. I'm not going to be able to get to them all in the interest of time, but what I will do is I will collect the questions and send them on to the speakers uh, so they know your question and they know uh, your reaction to their presentation. And I hope that there might be some opportunity in the future to continue the conversation uh, on those questions. So for today, uh, that's all. I want to thank you very much for participating in the seminar, to our speakers for sharing the new research and their findings with us, and to the University of Oslo for organizing today's event. Uh, please note there will be a new seminar every first Wednesday of the month. You can find more information about the seminar series on brokex.org. Uh, please mark your calendars for the next seminar. Uh, which will be about inequality in contemporary China. It will be held on October 6 at 9 p.m. Beijing time, 3 p.m. Oslo time, and 9 a.m. U.S. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, Dr. Riza Hasmath will be speaking on ethnicity and inequality in China, and Dr. Man Manfred Elfstrom will speak on workers and change in China, uh, with Dr. Ding Yu Mao chairing that seminar. Uh, thank you very much again, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. <laughs>